everybody, and welcome to another episode. Uh, I'm Charles Max Wood, and today is Labor Day. Um, we had an episode scheduled, but the go- the guest didn't show up. Um, typically on a holiday, I wouldn't even show up, but since we had a guest scheduled, I wanted to make sure I was here for him. But um, yeah, I don't know what happened, so we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, see if we can get him rescheduled. But yeah, um, none of my co-hosts showed up either, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump in and talk for a half hour or so, and just give you uh, a quick rundown on some of the things that I've been thinking about. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So um, lately I've been working on uh, basically how to keep current course, an email course on devchat.tv. In fact, if you pop over there, um, a little pop-up will pop up after about five minutes or five seconds and, you know, offer to let you into the course. Um, And then I'll just send you about 10 or 12 emails and it's just going to run through, hey, you know, how do you stay current? In other words, how do you figure out what to learn? How do you make a plan? How do you figure out how you learn? And then um, essentially, you know, the different ways to actually pick things up. And it's, it's interesting. I started doing essentially a really long monologue for JavaScript Jabber. And then Joe Eames jumped in. He, he showed up about 20 minutes late. His life has been insane lately. And, and so, you know, he, he was a little later than I was willing to wait around for to get started. So, uh, but we wound up having a really interesting conversation about it. You should go check that out. But there, there's just a little bit more to it that I wanted to talk to. And, uh, you know, nobody else is here to sort of derail my monologue. So I'm going to jump in and just run through this stuff. We may also take this episode and drop it into other shows as we need fillers. So we'll see where that winds up. But anyway, and a lot of this stuff's going to wind up also on the DevRev. Um, I'm planning on starting that up this week. So anyway, let's go ahead and just, just get in and get started. Uh, one of the things that I find really interesting is that a lot of people will ask me, hey, how do you get started? How do you get, um, how, you know, how do you k- stay current? How do you know what to talk about or what to learn about or what to what to move through things with? You know, h- how do you know what to learn next? And people get really frustrated because they just don't know. And when you're talking about the way that you move forward with things and you're talking about the direction and the pace of technology, there really isn't a roadmap. When you're getting started with a technology like JavaScript, there are several roadmaps out there, right? So you can follow any one of them and it'll take you all the way from learning JavaScript all the way up into Angular or React or Vue or just writing vanilla JavaScript or doing something else that's interesting and and you know, creative and fun and at the same time productive. And so you can follow any of those paths and they'll teach you enough JavaScript to be dangerous. And then they'll teach you enough Angular to be dangerous. And then they'll teach you enough of a state management library. You know, you kind of get the picture. But once you get past that, then it gets a little more tricky and a little less obvious. And so you have to go in and you have to start attacking things from the point of view of, okay, what do I need to be learning next in order to level up? And a lot of people get frustrated because they want to be leveling up. They just don't know how. And so I'm just going to walk through my process a bit. A lot of this is going to be in the email course, but uh, definitely go check it out because I've got some other stuff in there. I've got some stories and uh, just, you know, some some other things in there that will help you figure things out. But uh, yeah, so what should you be studying? What kinds of things should you be looking at as far as staying current and, and keeping up on things? Well, a lot of times I turn it around and I ask people, why? Why do you want to stay current? Why do you, you know, why are you worried about it? Why, you know, why do you, why do you care about staying current? And it's interesting because about half of the answers I get are, well, I want to be competitive in the job market. 
And the other half of the answers are either something else or an I don't know. And the thing is, is that if you're going to put in a bunch of time to level up, you should probably have some idea what you want to level up to. And a lot of people are will tell me, well, I don't know where I want to end up. And I'll tell them that's a really good thing to think about. At the same time, yeah, you don't have to have the final answer. And to be perfectly honest, I generally, it's funny because when I was, when I was full-time development in a career and working through things, I, I didn't know where I wanted to end up either, right? I just knew I wanted to get better. And I wanted to get better. Part of it was job competitive, you know, mobility, competitive, blah, 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 right? Um, but some, a lot of it was just that I was going to conferences, I talked to people, and I wanted to sound smart. And part of it was that I just really loved what I did and I wanted to get better at it. And so there, there were different reasons, but I didn't really have a solid thing. Now, I generally do. I, I know about where I want to end up in a year or three years. But, but back then, I didn't. And so I, I don't blame people for not knowing this. But I also highly encourage people to sit down and think about it. And the other thing is, is that even if you sit down and you figure out, okay, this is where I think I want to end up. And then you change it in three, six months. That's fine. That's totally fine. Because what will happen is you're going to sit down and you're going to start figuring this stuff out. And then you're going to go, huh, I've been studying toward this goal. And I realized that that goal doesn't fit me well. Well, guess what? You still learned something. You still made progress. You, you, you learned whatever it was that you were picking up over those three to six months toward that one goal. You just now know that there's somewhere else you're going to want to end up. And that's way more productive than just aimlessly running around and picking up new technologies. So I still encourage you to figure that out. And if you can't figure out anything out with any certainty, then just pick one and start heading that way, right? So maybe it's, well, I want to start speaking at more conferences, or I want to start, uh, I want to start a podcast, or maybe it's something around, you know what, I want to be the systems architect for, for the team that I'm on, or I want to be able to mentor more people. Or maybe it is just I want to know the latest and greatest things so that I can go get a job uh, with a company that's working on cutting edge technology. And then that's all good, too. Right. When it comes down to the job search option and having the job mobility, unless you think you're going to be moving jobs within the next year, I just don't find that a very compelling argument. Um, I find it a much more compelling argument to say, OK, well, I'm going to double down on the technologies that we're using here and spend as much time being as productive and uh, valuable as possible at the job you're in. Because when it comes down to it, the companies, the kinds of companies that you want to work for, they may not use those same technologies. But what I found is that a lot of them will hire people for personality and aptitude, as opposed to actual knowledge. And so if you wind up going over there, and working for them, and um, interviewing with them, and you basically get in, and you have the conversation and you're like, well, we were using these six technologies. And so I went through this, I put myself through my own program to actually level up on those technologies, I would hire you in about two seconds. Because I know that if I get you over here, then you're going to be putting in your time to learn the technology set that we're using. And so I, I, I'm just not going to mess around with Oh, well, darn, you know, you've done angular for the last three years, and we do react here. I won't care. Because I know that you're going to go in, you're going to do the work to figure out how to use React, and you're going to become one of the most valuable people on my team just by virtue of the fact that you're working to keep up. And so anyway, I, I guess I'm just talking through some of these scenarios, but you really do need to figure out where you want to end up. Now, one other thing with the job search that I'm going to just harp on for a minute, and this, this comes out of the uh, Get a Coder Job book that I wrote um, last year, or I, I guess I finished it this year, but I wrote most of it last year. And I'm working on getting it published right now. But anyway, um, basically, if you are trying to get a new job, so let's say that you're on the job search or you know you're going to be on the job search within the next few months, then what you want to be doing is go research the companies that you think you're going to want to work for. So let's say you want to work for Facebook or maybe you want to work for a startup, right? And so you find out what startups are using these days and then go out and learn those technologies, you know, learn the things that are going to give you aptitude in those positions. and then. Once you have those skills down, you're going to be much more desirable to those people. And so then you can go in and you can have the, you know, you're going to stand out more because you know the things that they're going to want to learn. 
And if you go in and you actually explain, I learned these things specifically because I knew I'd need them to get this job. That, that, that goes a long way, a lot longer way than the people who are saying, well, I, I worked at a place where, oh, I'm a half hour early. That's the deal. One of the things that I have as a goal for devchat.tv is to cover technologies that are up and coming, things that we're probably going to have to deal with on a more regular basis in the future. Some of these include AI, VR, and one of them is blockchain. So I reached out to one of the experts that I knew, Gregory McCubbin, and we pulled together a few other people and we've started a podcast called Adventures in Blockchain. So if you're looking at blockchain as something that you may want to work in, something that you're curious about learning more about, or something that you just want to keep current on until you have the opportunity to make a career jump and go over and work in blockchain and crypto, then definitely check out Adventures in Blockchain. You can find it at adventuresinblockchain.io. All right, folks. So um, you, you might notice a, a slight change in the recording. I'm just going to uh, call it out right here. Um, so I started that episode or I started this episode um, on Labor Day. And it turned out that I had showed up a half hour early to the call. And that's why nobody was there for me. So I, I quit recording and then jumped on the call with the regular panel or with Josh and, and whoever our guest was um, last week. And yeah, I didn't finish this episode. And what was funny is this episode got pushed to my team and my team listened to it and they were like, you were on a roll. That was awesome. So I'm just going to keep going. And uh, yeah, so where I was, where I left off was essentially where uh, people are looking for jobs. And so they're, you know, they're gaining skills and things to learn those jobs. And what's funny is, is that that is the common answer that I get for why do you want to stay current is so that you have job mobility. But I, I think that's kind of a false flag in some ways, because what you really should be looking for is a job that you really enjoy that you're going to stay at. Now, I, I do want to point out that some people are going to get to a place where, um, you know, they, they're in a job for a few years, and then they realize that they, they want to move on, right? There, there's something else out there that they want. And so the, the job that they got when they got it was the right job for them at that time. But what really wound up happening was, eventually they, they just grew. And so maybe they got interested in another framework or another technology or another, you know, something else. And so they, they moved on to that. And so it's time to move on. Or maybe they're in the stage of their career where they're going to move into another company where they're the team lead or the CTO or something like that. And so again, um, you know, the, the right job doesn't mean the right job forever. The right job is generally just, you know, the right job for wherever you're trying to get to and what you're trying to do. But in a lot of other cases, you really do need to focus on the, the things that are going to get you where you want to be at where you're at. And so if you're not looking for that job, as I said before, or you're not going to be looking for a job anytime soon, then looking for the things that are going to get you to those other places, be it, um, I want to speak more, I want to be more well known, I want to write a blog, I want, you know, whatever, you need to be learning the things that are going to achieve those goals, and not focus so much on the job mobility. Because if you can create these other areas of your or build up these other areas of your career, what you're going to find is that a lot of those things are things that are going to make you very attractive to employers later. And so you kind of get the job mobility and the in demandness automatically out of these other things. So I, I don't love job mobility or, you know, my ability to move to another place or whatever as a reason uh, for the focus of your level up. I feel like a lot of these other things make better focuses um, because jobs and job searches are very short term things. And these days, if you have enough experience, even if it's not directly with the technology that somebody wants you to know, if you have enough experience generally, then people are going to pick you up and they're going to hire you anyway. Now, I'm probably 15 to 20 minutes into this episode, and I want to keep going because there's more to this process than just knowing why you're doing it and then picking the right technologies to get you where you want, right? So, um, you know, the job search is pretty apparent, right? I want to work at a company like X. Companies like X need me to have these skills, so I'm going to go learn those skills, right? Um, for, for speaking, it's more the skills of figuring out what's in demand, figuring out what people want to hear about, learning how to submit uh, calls for proposals, um, figuring out how to become the kind of speaker that they actually pay to come in and do keynotes, if that's what you're looking at, 
you know, so, so you've got these other levels of things, right? These other skills, right? So if you're trying to get a, get in as a speaker, then, you know, Toastmasters or, um, you know, practicing in front of other people or, you know, whatever it is, if you want to be writing blogs, then maybe you're going to spend a little bit of time learning about how to do SEO and do searches for things that are in demand there and things like that. If you're looking at leveling up to be that person at the company that is the architect and things like that, you know, like we talked about before, then you're probably going to be looking at a little bit higher level code organization and things like that, those skills. And so, yeah, focusing on those areas is going to get you there. And then if you figure out that the job you're at doesn't offer the kinds of things that fall in with what you want, then you can move. And if you, if you've been building those skills for a while, then it becomes pretty easy to just move along. But then it, it gets down to, okay, so how do I learn all this stuff? And I highly, highly recommend to people that they have a plan. Now, this is the one thing that's super nice for in the speaking arena, for example, if you go to Toastmasters, is that they give you a plan, right? They give you the competent communicator manual. Now, they've changed the system since I was at to in Toastmasters. I didn't get out by choice. I had something else that conflicted on the time front, and I couldn't find another club that really matched my schedule. And so I didn't go back. Um, that's changed now. And so I may go back to the same club I was going to before. But um, they, they give you a competent communicator manual and it has 10 speeches in it, right? And so the first one is, you know, the icebreaker and you introduce yourself. And then, you know, there are different other aspects of speaking that it just gives you to practice those skills and build those skills. And then you're in a place where people are giving you feedback, right? Because somebody evaluates your speech and gives you the feedback that you need to become better. And so you get a lot of these things and you get a program to follow to do it. With with blogging, you know, you could go pick up Darren Rouse's uh, 31 Days to Build a Better Blog and do what it says, right? Because it's a step-by-step, -step. write this blog post, write this blog post, write this blog post, do this research, write this, right? And so you can follow that along. You might go pick up an SEO course and just follow the program. Um, you know, so, so you get the idea, right? Um, if somebody gives you a program for it, then you get a plan out of the box. And that's really the nice thing about some of these areas where they have courses, right? So you go take a course on Udemy or Thinkster.io or Pluralsight or, I mean, there are a whole bunch of them out there, right? And so you go find the course on whatever it is you want to learn and you learn it. Same thing with a book, right? Is that if you work your way through the book, then you kind of follow a plan, right? Now, some books are more reference material. And so they're not going to give you a plan per se. It's just going to be this vast amount of knowledge that they expect you to assimilate. Whereas you know, others are more of the tutorial angle and they're, they're expecting you to learn something while you're doing it. So they'll walk you through step by step. But, but that's kind of a quick and easy way to get to a plan. But if you don't have one of these, right, it's I want to become a software architect, right? I want that to be my title and I want to be doing these kinds of things. And you're not finding kind of a ready-made plan out there, then make your own, right? Then just sit down and say, okay, well, these are the skills that I'm going to need to learn. And the, the easiest way to figure that out is to go talk to somebody who has the job that you want, right? And so then you sit down and you say, look, I want to get to the place where I can do what you do. What skills do I need, right? And so they'll now give you a list. And then you can go out and then you can say, okay, well, I'm going to learn this, and then 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 I'm going to learn this, right? And so now you have a plan. Now you know, these are the things that I want to go learn. These, this is the process that I'm going to go through in order to learn them. And this is where people get a little bit lost. And, and to be honest, mostly it's because they, they sit down and they make the plan and they're like, okay, well, now I need to know what courses I'm going to go take. Or now I need to know what books I'm going to go read. And no, 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 no. You just need that list of, of things that you're going to learn and make a plan out of it. Now, I think also it's also helpful. Um, but again, you know, if, it, if it's to a particular goal, then you may just follow the plan just for that goal. But I think it's helpful if you're, not as, I guess, time constrained to learn these things is also to spend a little bit of time on some areas outside of the expertise that you have and that you're going to be building anyway. So for example, let's say you make a six month plan to become that uh, senior architect, blah, 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 leader person, right? What you may want to do is just spend a couple of weeks and make sure that you're spending a couple of weeks learning something like blockchain or AI or, you know, something that's, that's up and coming that's, you know, that may be another avenue, right? It doesn't have to be your focus, but if you're staying on top of these things or there's a, let's say that a new packaging system comes out that's not Webpack or Parcel.js and you're in JavaScript, 
you so you spend a couple of weeks learning it, even though it's not on your plan. Um, you know, just, just working those in periodically so that you're staying on top of the new technology coming out really helps. And you don't have to stay on top of everything, but spending a little bit of time on the things that look like they're going to, you know, form the future is, is a good thing. And then spend the rest of your time working on those things that fit into the plan that are going to get you where you want to go. And really the plan is, is I want to, like I said, I'm going to learn this A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then what you can do is you can stick to the plan. And if your plan changes, not, not your plan plan, but like if your outcome changes, right? So you start learning this stuff and you're like, this stuff is really boring. And yeah, you know, the more I talk to this architect guy that I've been talking to, the more I realize I really don't want that job. Um, when, when I was in college, incidentally, um, I was a computer engineering major, which is basically designing chips in the silicon and then writing really low level programming, right? So I, I wrote a bunch of assembly code and C code in college. Um, I did some Java, uh, Java and uh, C++, but those were the computer science classes that I took, you know, to kind of round out my major. But yeah, in, anyway, I decided at one point I wanted to be an attorney and I wanted to do patent law. And so what did I do? <laughs> I went out and I got an internship. <laughs> I'd been working in IT at the university for like four years. And I went and got an internship writing patent applications for a company that built like uh, dr uh, oil drilling bits and, you know, technology to, to drill for oil. And, you know, they were based over in Provo, Utah. Anyway, so I was working with them and understanding their technology well enough to write these patents. Because if I had experience writing patents before I went to law school, then I, you know, I felt like I'd have a leg up. And if I had experience doing it when I graduated, then it'd be much easier for me to get a job. And so I was thinking ahead that way. And so I went and got that internship. And I figured out after about two months that I hated it. I hated everything about that internship other than my friends. I, I had a friend that worked there that helped me get the internship. And, uh, but, but man, I, I hated it. Um, you know, the technology was interesting. Writing the patent application sucked. And I'm like, man, if this is the job, I am out. And I am out hard. And what's funny is I went and took like the, the law school admittance test, the LSAT, and I was scoring, scoring in like the 85th, 86th percentile. So if I had wanted to go to law school and I took a few courses too to help me get into law school at, at the university, you know, I took like a, a logic course and, and a few other things. And so, you know, I invested some serious time into this. And if I'd wanted to go to law school, I could have, right? Because I had a 3.0 GPA. When I graduated, I had a 2.97, I think. So, so generally I leave that off of my resumes, incidentally, uh, just cause it's not a 3.0, but, um, if I had really wanted to go to law school, I could have, I could have done it, but, and, and my, my mom would have been happy cause I would have gotten my, you know, a doctorate and all that stuff. Right. So it would have checked a bunch of boxes for me, but I didn't like it at all. I didn't enjoy it at all. And so I, I bowed right back out, uh, went back to my IT job. My, my boss wasn't extremely excited about that just because I had left and come back and, you know, and he felt like I had kind of flaked out on him, but I learned, I learned what, it, you know, I learned that that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so change of plans. Right. And so my new plan was finish my computer engineering degree and then figure out what I'm going to do next. If I'm going to get a master's degree or if I'm going to, you know, go get a job. And so um, I, that, that's what I did. And so if you get into it and, you know, two or three months in, you figure out, you know, Software architect, not, not, not where I want to go, right? You, you can change your plan, you know? So you sit down and you say, okay, well, I'm going to scrap all this other stuff I was going to learn because it's not going to get me where I want to go anymore because that's not where I want to end up. And then go do something else. And I'll tell you that, I mean, that, that, that's awesome, right? You, you figured stuff out. That's not where you wanted to go. And so then you can make a new plan and go back. So don't be afraid to scrap the plan. But if, if you're moving along that, that clip, that plan, and it looks like it's going to take you where you want to go, then stick with it um, and stick it out all the way. What, what this brings up, though, is that, uh, you know, as you're following the plan, how do you do that, right? How do I go learn these, these things that I feel like I need to learn? Because some of it's going to be conceptual, right? Let, go back, going back to that software uh, architect thing, right? A lot of it's going to be more conceptual than practical, right? It's going to be, we're going to organize the code this way, and we're going to follow these development practices to get there. 
And we're going to do these kinds of things in the code in order to make everything talk nicely to each other, you know, which, which some of it kind of bridges the gap, but a lot of it really is just, I understand how this stuff gets organized. And so I'm going to approach it in this way. And a lot of it's going to be uh, down to other stuff where it's okay. Um, you know, when, when I'm trying to choose which tools to pick, I'm going to pick these kinds of tools because X, Y, and Z. And, you know, that's very conceptual, you know, it's, it's, you know, how, how do these things go together? And so, you know, you're not going to be writing code so much as you're just going to be making decisions. And so, you know, as you, as you dive into this, and I'm saying this not ever having actually held the, the job title of software architect, right? So I may be mischaracterizing what that is, you know, so, so you may be getting into some of this that's conceptual. And then other times it's going to be, okay, now we're going to actually structure this class in this way so that it plays nicely with all of the other pieces in the system. And so, yeah, you're going to wind up with some stuff that kind of bridges the gap. And so how do you learn it, right? Because the, the practical stuff, uh, I feel like at least for most people, not necessarily everybody, but for a lot of people, there's going to be some hands-on aspect to their learning that's going to have to happen in order for them to do to learn the, the practical hands-on stuff. And then a lot of the conceptual stuff, you really just have to make sure that you understand it. You understand the underlying principles. You understand how they're applied. You understand what the exceptions are. And then you can understand how to move up. So how do you make that plan so that you can learn all this stuff so that you can get to where you want to go? And even if you're going to be doing more practical stuff like working in Angular or React or Vue or Elixir or Ruby or whatever, right? There, there are still some conceptual ideas and principles that those languages are based on that you're still going to want to understand. So to some level, you're going to have to learn both. It, there's just no way around it. You're just going to have to learn both. But, you know, depending on which direction you're going, some of it may be more hands-on than less. So when, when you're doing that, it's like, okay, so what do I do, right? Do I take a course? Do, you, do I, you know, be that an in-person course or an online course, you know, through video? Do I read a book? Do I listen to podcasts? Do I, you know, there are a lot of different ways to learn and knowing which one to do can be tricky too. Now, what I recommend to people is that you try at least one of everything and you give it a real try because um, some of them are going to feel more natural than others. But at the end of the day, one thing that I figured out like books, and I'll, I'll just give you an example on books, right? So I read a ton of books, a ton of books. Now, usually it's on business or, you know, self-improvement or things like that, right? Though I have read quite a number of technical books about software, right? And initially they were just hard. It was hard to get into them. And then it's like, oh, there's all this stuff in here and how am I going to remember it all and apply it all and blah, 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 blah. And so I, I didn't really love books as a way to learn. And what changed was after I had read a number of books and worked through a number of books and done the homework that came out of the number of books, that's when I figured out that, oh, wow, books are really valuable, but they're much more valuable when I actually put into practice what's in them. And so if I sit down and I, you know, I draw out the pieces that I need to draw out and I go after the things that really matter and I make a plan to use that stuff, that's when it pays off, right? And so if you're reading a book about software architecture, even if some of it's more conceptual, then you can go build a couple of sample projects and figure out, oh, that's why this principle is so important. Because when I leave it out, right, because you deliberately built two, one that used it and one that didn't, it was like, oh, this is why this principle is really valuable. But on this other side, this is where this principle made this other thing harder. Or, you know, maybe, maybe it's all upside. I don't know. But you can figure that out, right? And so you, you get in and with books, I found that you really do have to sit down and work through the mental exercises and then sometimes work through the hands-on exercises just to figure the stuff out. But in the end, you're going to come out of it with a much stronger understanding. A few years ago at a JavaScript conference, I was approached by Nader Dabit. And you might know him for the React Native Radio podcast. He's also a developer evangelist for Amazon. And when he came to me, we had a conversation about React Native. And the thing that I love about React Native is that it's approachable, it's web technology, and it's cross-platform. And it makes a lot of things really easy for developers to jump in and do interesting things on mobile with JavaScript. So we've had this show now running for several years, React Native Radio, where we interview people about the React Native ecosystem, some of the things that are coming out in React and how they affect mobile, and other options that you have for mobile development. So if you're doing mobile development, you're doing it in JavaScript, you're looking for a good option, or maybe you're just trying to stay current with React Native, 
then go check out React Native Radio at reactnativeradio.com. Uh, video tutorials are a lot the same way. Now, you may find that you do video tutorials different from other people. I have a lot of friends that when they want to learn a new tech technology, they sign into a Pluralsight account and uh, they go find the course on it and they walk through the course with the instructor, right? All right, now we're going to, you know, we're going to type this in and what this does is this, this, and this. And they just go through the whole course. I can't do that. I, I just can't, right? And I know I can't. And so when I'm going to learn a new technology, yes, I use video, but uh, I hit my limit about an hour, hour and a half into the, the video tutorial. And so generally what I wind up doing is I will use video, right? So I'll go, I'll go kind of skim through a book or read through a book real quickly about a topic if I want to just have a, a general knowledge of it. And then when I start to implement it, then I'll go do the first part of a tutorial. And then what happens is once I get far enough into the tutorial to where I'm past all the hairy stuff, which is usually set up in a lot of in, in new technology anyway, it's generally set up. It's like, how do I set up and organize my view app? How do I set up and organize my Elixir app, you know, or Rails app or Express app or whatever, right? And, you know, where are the pitfalls that they're going to walk, you know, they're going to trace me around for a minute. And as soon as I'm past all that stuff, I go freestyling. Because I learn much better hands on. And so then what I do is I'm okay, how do I do this? And so then I spend time on the internet actually looking, okay, how do I and so then it's okay, well, you build this component in react and you do this and this and this or if you use create react app, then here's that you write and so you figure that out angular CLI is going to walk you through this and here's a plugin that does it. And so you, you figure out these bits of things and uh, you, you figure out okay, this is how I do it. You know, same thing with React Native, since this is React Native Radio. I, I kind of generalized it to a lot of different technologies, but the idea is the same, right? So in React Native, it's, or yeah, it's, here's how you build this, you know, UI element, this, here's how you hook it up to your JavaScript function on the back end to make it do what it's got to do, right? And uh, so, so you figure that out. How do I test this? How do I test that? And, you know, and so I do a lot of that hands-on. The books and the podcasts for me, generally do a lot more in the way of just giving me the conceptual ideas behind it, right? And so it's, okay, well, it's built on these systems and these systems are based on these ideas. And so if you understand these ideas and you understand how the architecture works off of those ideas, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, that means that I'm naturally going to use it this way instead of that way. Boom, there you go. And so I tend to use a lot of all of them, but a lot of my focus really comes down to the hands-on stuff. So at the end of the day, I'm trying it out. I'm installing it and I'm playing with it and I'm poking at it and I'm, you know, I'm getting there. And, and that's one thing that I do. Another thing that I do is I'll often go look at, I'll, I'll go look at programs that other people have written that are doing similar things to mine. So, you know, if somebody, one of the things that I want to build in React Native, I might wind up hiring somebody to do it just because I'm super busy. But one of the things I want to do is actually build an app for devchat.tv, right? And so um, I, I went and talked to some folks that, had, you know, that build React Native apps. And they said, well, your project with your budget is a little low for us, right? It's not enough work and it doesn't, you know, it's not going to make us enough money to consider doing it, right? And, and I get it, you know, every business caters to different customer set and I wasn't their customer. Um, but what they did tell me was, you know, there are a lot of templates for React Native apps out there and you could go and pick one up that, that does most of what you want. And then you can tweak it to do what you want, right? And yeah, you're probably gonna have to build in your own data layer and things like that. But it's gonna have most of the other stuff there and just available to, to run. And so, you know, I, I went and looked at that. And, and that's worked out pretty well. I, I haven't done a whole lot with it yet. Um, and I'm sure I'm gonna run into some gotchas where I'm just gonna be like, what did this person do here? But anyway, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's just this focus on, on something different that, that's just going to, you know, it's going to get you there. But yeah, for me, it's a lot of hands-on. And I, I think for a lot of other developers, you're, you're going to need some level of that, right? Because you're getting paid to write code. And so your practice is probably going to need to involve you writing some code. Um, you know, if you understand it on a conceptual level, you may not understand some of the nuances that actually get the code written. And so, yeah, I recommend to people that they try it out. But yeah, go, go listen to the other stuff. You know, the, the podcast, we talk about a lot of things conceptually because we don't provide video. 
And if we did, it would just be talking heads. And so, you know, you're, you're not going to get a demo out of it. And that's not the, the, whole, the point of our podcast. Um, some of the other ones, you know, it is hands on. And so you're going to see somebody actually jump in and, you know, and, and, and crank some code out. But you can go watch videos of people building stuff and you can, you can do a lot of that other stuff. You can go read other people's code. You can read books. You can watch videos. You can read blog posts. You can follow tutorials. And uh, I recommend that you try them all and see where they fit in your learning program. And what you may find is like me, you know, you kind of get a blend of all of them depending on what stage you're at. Or you may find that, you know what, podcasts just don't do it for me. Or books just don't do it for me. Or blog posts, I just, you know, I, I lose attention. And so, you know, you may find that videos are the way to go. You know, that, that's kind of the, the way, but then you can sit down and you can flesh out your plan, right? Then you can actually sit down and you can say, okay, well, I need to learn these six things. And so I'm going to read a book on this one because it's highly conceptual. And then I'm going to write a couple of projects, just real simple ones that, that demonstrate these, you know, these design patterns or whatever. And then uh, I'm going to learn this next technology and I'm going to be able to blah, 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 you know, do it there. That's the other thing that's nice about the sample projects is that when you get in and you start building a sample project, what you find out is you, you, you get that hands-on experience that tells you whether or not you really get it, right? Because if you're running to, into a lot of roadblocks, you don't understand it well enough yet to actually go and uh, do it professionally. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be stack overflowing the heck out of that thing just to figure out how to do it. And you're going to wind up doing a poor job of it. And so, you know, just, just back into it and do it a few times. And that way you can come at it later on and say, I get this. I know how it goes together. I've done it a few times. And so now I can build it for work or now I can build it into this open source project, or now I can go chase these other things and you can, you know, you can go own the process and, and make it what you want to be. But uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's essentially the, the process. But once you've learned it, then, then you can go and you can tell people that you've done it. And then, you know, let's say that job mobility is an issue for you. Then when you get interviewed about it, you can say, well, I built these couple sample projects while I was getting to understand it. And then I built it into the app for the people I was working for. And, uh, you know, and, and now, I, now I know it. And uh, overall, you know, you kind of get a good feel for all the rest of that stuff. You know, podcasting and blogging about things is another way where you're teaching other people or explaining things in a way where, you know, other people should be able to pick up uh, what you're doing. And that, that also helps. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I, I, I really just uh, recommend to people that they find the resources that are going to show them how to do whatever it is they want to do. Uh, figure out what things work for you. Make sure you have some hands-on experience with it. And then, and then go do it. And then maybe write a blog post or record a podcast or a video afterward just to demonstrate that you get it. But uh, yeah, all of that stuff is going to come together in order to help you learn it. And then once you know it, then what you can do is you can say, okay, well, I learned all these six things. And then you can actually go try and go out for the soft, software architect job at your work. Or you can go apply to work with whoever it is that you know that does it. Or you can, you know, you can go move into these other areas and, and make those steps. And that's kind of the ultimate uh, test of whether or not you've learned the right things and learned them well enough is whether or not you get to that place that you want to get to. But I encourage people also to be a little bit patient. Um, in a lot of cases, you can pick up these technologies a bit at a time and you step up to the point where you actually, you can actually, you know, get what you want, but sometimes it takes some time. So, you know, you may find that you're steadily improving and that's enough to get you a raise, but it doesn't get you the job position you want because you're not ready. And so, you, you know, you'll, you'll figure that out. So you go apply for those team lead jobs and they go, team lead, you know, you're, you're not ready yet. Here are the other things you need to learn. Or, you know, you may wind up, you know, trying to get that CTO position or whatever, you know, and again, you're going to get the feedback, hopefully that you need to go, okay. So what they were looking for is somebody that has a little bit more of this kind of experience or somebody that's done a little bit more of these kinds of things. And you'll figure out, you know, what the other steps are to get you there. Or you may figure out that what they're looking for is completely different from what you want to do. Um, and that's the other thing to keep in mind, too, is, you know, whether you want to be a conference speaker or a CTO or a team lead or a software architect or some dude that talks about code on podcasts or whatever, is that different people are successful at it in different ways. 
And so you don't have to be the same kind of speaker as you see speaking at these conferences, right? You can put your own style on it, but you're still going to have to have some basic skills to get on the stage. You know, same with podcasting or blogging and being successful at it is you don't have to sound like me in order to be a podcaster, but it does take a little bit of time to kind of find your voice and get everything together so that you can do it. And so, you know, uh, one company CTO is going to be different from another's. Um, so all of these things come together in, in make it, you know, a little bit tough to say this is the exact path. But the more that you can define, I want to be a CTO at this kind of company that runs in this kind of way that's going to let me do these kinds of things, then you can really start to hone in, okay, where does that exist? And what skills am I going to need in order to get that job? And that, that's really going to help you more than anything else, because then you can make that plan. And then you can figure out what the steps are to learn that stuff. And then you can sit down and you can self-evaluate and you can go, did I learn it well enough? Well, I can do it, right? Or I can demonstrate it or I can teach somebody else it. And then from there, you move into the phase where you can actually get what you want. And so, you know, when people come and they're like, how do I keep up? I mean, it's, it's a process, but keeping up all on its own for no reason isn't useful. And it really isn't going to help you get where you want to go as, as much as having a plan for this is where I'm trying to get to. And so this is what I'm going to go do and learn that that will help you so much more than the process of, you know, just blindly reaching out for the latest and greatest thing. And so anyway, that that's kind of my rant on that. I'm sorry it got broken up into two parts, but that's kind of the deal here. Um, I am going to throw out a few picks here. And, and really, I'm just going to kind of get to this idea more than anything else. So, you know, the, the picks, I guess, can be the the sources that I'm getting this from. But lately, I've, I've read a few books that just kind of all, I guess, compound on each other and bring me to this idea. And so the, the idea is essentially that sometimes it takes time to get what you want. And sometimes that time doing the right things is the essential ingredient to getting what you want. And, and what I'm talking about in particular is, so I've, I've been out there. Uh, running this podcast network for, I don't know, like Ruby Rogue started eight, eight plus years ago. And so, you know, I, I've had more than one podcast running for uh, since then, basically. And, you know, eventually we started devchat.tv, which, you know, pulled everything in and uh, ran everything off the same podcast network and stuff like that. And so, you know, things have ramped up continually. And what's really fascinating about a lot of this is that um, it, it took time, right? And I still find myself falling into the trap where it's like, all I have to do is start posting on LinkedIn and I'm going to get a bazillion followers and a bazillion listeners. And it just, it never works that way. Um, w- the way that it works is I, I put my, my stuff out there in that way and I pick up a handful here and a handful there and a handful here and a handful there. And eventually somebody will listen to some of those and then have a friend tell them about it. And they'll be like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to check that out. And, you know, so doing the right things over and over and over again are eventually going to get you where you want to go, but there rarely ever is a silver bullet, right? There rarely ever is just that killer thing that just makes everything take off. You know, Ruby Rogues and JavaScript Jabber grew a ton in the beginning out of word of mouth, and that worked for us because there weren't a lot of other options out there, but there are more and more things pulling for people's attention. And the other thing is, is that a a lot of our audiences have have kind of stayed static with size, you know, so some people drop off and other people come in. And, you know, as the community grows, yeah, we tend to trend upward. But it's not this astronomical growth anymore, because, you know, people have a lot of options. And a lot of people don't want to listen to work stuff when they're at home, or in their leisure time. And then other people can't get enough of it because they love JavaScript to death and they love React Native to death. And so anyway, uh, by doing kind of the slow burn things, right, we're, we're taking the right steps. And yeah, I mean, if I see something that I think is going to make us just go to the moon and it's not going to cost me the company if I lose, then I'll go for it. But the other end of it is, is that a lot of this just just picking up the momentum, right? And so we do pick up a few people off LinkedIn and then they go tell their friends. And so as that opens into a new network of people, 
we reach more people and our audience grows. And anyway, so it, the the whole idea, so good to great. Um, I was also listening to the Gary V audio experience or, you know, anyway, it's uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's podcast. And uh, he was talking to somebody and he said that, you know, he talks to people and he tells them, you know, you've got a great idea in, you know, six or seven years, that, that's going to be a big thing. And they get all disappointed because they want something tomorrow. And again, you know, it just kind of, uh, pushes that, that idea that, you know, uh, that that's what it takes. And, you know, you got to get that idea. So anyway, that's my pick. Now I've got to go put my three-year-old down for a nap. So I'm going to jump off. But, uh, anyway, um, that those are basically my thoughts on, uh, keeping current. So have a good one. Uh, we'll have another episode next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. 